Well, loved ones, uh, I just want to take a second before John gets up and shares what God's laid in his heart for you, and I uh, just, just want to say that it's a, a privilege to have you here. Um, John is uh, with his lovely wife, Kendra, here this morning. You can, you can clap for her, too. It's cool. That was a warm-up, okay? And John's mom. It's kind of cool. Um, this is a spot for Jesus, not for anybody else, but just to pause for a second and just say that uh, last week Kendra sang the national anthem there at, uh, at the Orlando Magic game. That was kind of cool. So if you saw that, if you haven't seen it, you should check it out online. Uh, it's really, really, I, it's, it's amazing. I didn't know there was that kind of talent in our area. So uh, God has gifted you, and that's a privilege. Does she just sit at home and sing to you all day? Is that why you married her? Anyway, um, <laughs> So, so I just want to uh, just say that, that, that John, uh, he's a dear friend, and I love him very, very much. Um, John, uh, here's the thing about John. He, he, he came to serve at, at Victory, uh, which is over and going out towards Umatilla on 19, and he served there under his pastor for about 14 years, I think it was, something like that, a long time. And just, just humble, just serving under uh, Pastor Cox and being a youth leader and just doing as he was told and just being obedient to that and just served humbly, humbly, humbly. And then when it came time for um, Pastor Cox to retire, of course, the, the next move, of course, for that church was to have John be their lead pastor. And he um, moved into that position and served humbly. And, and the church grew from a very small little church to hundreds of people. And um, for some strange reason, I don't understand his thinking at all. I love him. I don't understand his thinking. He didn't think he was that good of a leader, and so he stepped away from that. Um, I wish I was half the leader that this guy is. Um, the thing that's amazing about him, the reason why God can use him powerfully, and I want you to listen up this morning, is because um, a man who can do what he does and be who he is and doesn't recognize that, that's humble. All right? And so God can use a man like that to speak to his people. So. Um, that being said, I'd like for you guys to uh, come to your feet and just welcome Pastor John from Revolution. Just welcome, give it a little rowdy maybe too. You could be a little rowdy. I love you. Thank you for being here. Glad to be here. Uh, I am honored and, and very excited to be with you this morning. I um, prayed fervently about what to share, um, and uh, it is interesting, my current position that I find myself in, uh, working uh, back in construction, which I am passionate about building things, um, and, and I believe that, uh, and I hope that you'll catch this this morning, that it speaks to our nature, one that was created by a creator um, and is sustained and nurtured by this amazing father in heaven being his creation we ought to have similar tendencies um, played out through our laid down lives that when we say yes to him <clears throat> he comes to dwell inside of us begins to change us from the inside out and things that we learn about him ought to manifest themselves in our lives and what we do on a daily basis him working through us so he works for us, but he also works through us uh, for the good of those whom he loves. And so, <clears throat> funny story, this is the way this all played out, and um, I hope that you can appreciate this. Oftentimes, uh, although I am typically quiet and reserved, sometimes I have a foot-shaped mouth, and I open it, and things come out that shouldn't. And there was a particular day at work uh, a couple of years ago when uh, a, a lady sitting nearby, she said, uh, I just want to have enough money where I can quit my job, go live on the beach, hang out with nobody but my kids and my husband, and just drink pina coladas all day every day. And I'm just sitting over at my computer, kind of minding my own business when the mouth opened. And I said, that would be terrible. You would be fat, dumb, and you would get cancer. And she stopped what she was doing and she gave me this glare and she said, what do you mean? I said, 
if all you did all day every day was sit on the beach and drink pina coladas and not work and not hang out with people, those are the things that would happen. You would give fat, you would probably get sun cancer, and because you're not using your mind the way that you were created to use it, you're going to get dumber and dumber and dumber and dumber. And she's like, well, you know, when you put it that way, it, maybe it's not that attractive of a thing. And so I, uh, I, I want to um, maybe shift the way that, that we think as uh, followers of Christ, thank you so much, thank you, brother. Uh, as a faith family, if you work 40 hours a week, and some people would say, well, I remember my, my first part-time job, too. <laughs> For 40 years of your life, then you will put in 80,000 hours at a job in your lifetime. On top of that, if you go to college and you go to school, you put in another 15,000 hours just preparing to go to that workplace. And so about 95,000 hours of our life is spent working or preparing for work. And it's easy uh, in a surrounding like this where there's music and there's uh, children's church, church workers and there's people that, that get up and share the word of God. It's, it's easy to think that, well, I can't sing, play an instrument or speak, so I don't play a role in God's plan for the kingdom. It's easy day after day after day going to work, which I do on a daily basis, I work for the city of Mount Dora. I'm uh, working in the, uh, the construction, the building uh, department over there. And it's easy in our minds to think, you know, there's no way that this is God's calling for me. I should be doing more. There's a place for me. And, 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 and it's easy to, to yearn for mission work or, or a place in, in what we would call the local church. And, and we say there's got to be some ultimate purpose for me more than just Sales or teaching or uh, serving or whatever it is that you do. It's easy to say, you know, that's just how I provide for my family, but my real ministry is, is done here on Sundays. That's providing, but, but my work for God, it's done within these four walls. And, and we talk about this idea all the time that, that God has created us to make his glory known throughout the world, but is our job part of that plan? And, and if, if yes, then what are we doing and, and what is our mindset when we go to that place that God has clearly put us at for a time such as this? Because the reality is that 99.999% of followers of the way, of Christian men and women, do not have positions as pastors or uh, oversee missionaries or, or anything like that. We, we find ourselves in what the world would quite often call a secular position. And just right off the bat, I, just, I would love for you to abandon that word secular when it comes to you, child of God. Because when you say yes to him, uh, Colossians reveals that he comes to dwell inside of you. And from that point on, you're not waiting for another secondary moment where that spirit is somehow regenerated. When you say yes, the fullness of Christ in that moment. You don't have to say yes. You just, just realize that you need him. Because that's really what salvation is, right? Think about Paul. He's blind. He can't see. And all of a sudden it says that there's something like scales fall from his eyes. He's living his entire life learning about God, but he finally realizes he needs Christ. His eyes are open to the need of a Savior. Whew. 
The Spirit of God comes and dwells inside of them. Paul would say that it's a mystery in Colossians 1. And so the moment that you say, yes, secular ceases to exist in anything that you do. Everything from that moment on that you have been uh, grafted into the kingdom, into the family of God, is spiritual. But what we have this tendency in church culture to say, well, uh, I am relegated to a minor role over at Home Depot on Monday through Friday, but on Sunday, then that's really the major thing that I do. That's how I contribute to the Great Commission. Um, or there was a, a trend like in like my early walk with God where it was being not necessarily taught, but uh, implied that I wasn't doing what I needed to be doing at my job if I didn't host like a Bible study on Tuesday mornings with all of my coworkers. Or if I didn't have a, you remember that? I didn't have a prayer meeting on Wednesdays with my coworkers, then I wasn't doing everything that I was supposed to be doing as a child of God. Now, you know, granted, the other 39 hours, I could just be a jerk, but if I'm having a Bible study, then I'm participating in the commission that God has for me. And uh, by doing this, um, I think that, that we've lost sight of how God instructs us to feel about work. Now, there's, we, we'll fall into like four categories when it comes to work, and, and hopefully we kind of can all land on the same page when all of this is said and done. Because uh, there's most of us that feel that we're not really part of the Great Commission. We're just providing food for our uh, uh, families by going to work. And the Bible is very clear. If you don't work, you don't eat. And so work is very, very important. And we're going to see in more detail why in just a moment. But there's others that um, have kind of relegated work to a, a whole different level to where they're consumed by it. They're controlled by it. They, they don't rest. They work all the time, even when they are with the most precious gifts that they've been entrusted, their spouse and their children. They're still on their phone answering emails making phone calls, they're not there, their mind is somewhere else. And when we do that, uh, there is a danger of our work becoming our idol. And I believe more than anything, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if you have a Bible, you can turn there, or if you're on your phone, you can jump over there, it'll be up on the screen. I think that more than anything, 1 Corinthians is probably the most appropriate truth that ought to be the colander in which our work passes through. Verse 31, and it says, whether you eat or drink, and there's this fancy word, or whatever it is you do, do it all to the glory of God. <clears throat> and so, church, have you ever thought that how am I using this 80,000 hours or 95,000 hours for the glory of God? Because the gospel doesn't just affect what we do as a faith family, the gospel uniquely transforms the way that we understand what we do at our nine to five. Whatever you do, do it for the glory of God. Genesis 1 and 2 um, shows us that God delights in work. It says in those first two chapters of our Bible that not only does he delight in it, he enjoys it. He describes um, uh, his work in creation uh, as something that he delights in. And not coincidentally, it describes it in a seven-day work week. That he enjoys, he delights. The psalmist says this, the 104th Psalm, verse 30, it says, May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. 
Uh, he echoes this over in, in, in Proverbs chapter 8. It's the exact same language. The Bible depicts God as a working God who creates, sustains, nurtures, and provides. And in the process, follow this, not only does He work for us, but part of the work that he does, actually a large majority of the work that he does, he has chosen to do through us. God working, yes, but his working through you. Those that have said yes to him. In other words, all that God is doing in all creation, the providing, the nurturing, the sustaining, he's doing that for us through his work. The simplest form is this. The only reason that you are breathing right now is because God has chosen to allow us to breathe. And at any moment, if he says, nope, it all ends. And so the very sustaining of life, the reason that my heart has rhythm is because God has chosen to allow it to have rhythm. He works for us. He sustains each and every one of us even the good work that we do is actually Him doing it through us. I'm going to use Luther a little bit, Martin Luther, uh, in, in a lot of this. Um, one of the things that he says is this. When we pray the Lord's Prayer, we ask God to give us this day our daily bread, right? And He does. But check out what Martin Luther says. He says, how does He do it, though? He does it by means of the farmer who planted and harvested the grain. He does it by means of the baker who made the flour into bread. And he does it by means of the person who prepared our meal. And so you ask God for this day, your daily bread, and, and he is gracious enough to provide. But he did that through the work of many others. Long before we asked, God was preparing what we needed for this day. Luther goes on to say, he said, God could easily give grain and fruit without plowing and gardening. There, there's no reason that it had to be the way that it is outside of God saying, this is so. Before rain fell from the heavens, he chose for water to bubble up out of the ground. He can do it however he wants. But he's chosen to answer our prayers through the work of others. So he delights in his work, he works through each and every one of us. And we find ourselves in Genesis. Turn there if you would. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven, and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. We'll read all the way to 30. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, and over every little living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed and its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food, and it was so. God created man, and immediately he tells him, I have given you this to work. It becomes even more of a reality in Genesis chapter 2, verse 15, when God plants 
Adam in the garden. And, and listen to what the Bible says. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work. To work it and to keep it. See, in, in many of our minds and thoughts, work becomes another one of those four-letter words. But the reality of work is that it was given to us, notice the location that it was given us, prior to the fall of man. Work was given to us by God as a good thing before the entrance of sin. We think and we like to think that work is a product of the fall. Instead, work is part of our history from the very beginning. Philip Jensen said this, he said, if God came into the world uh, as a man, what would he be like? Uh, for the ancient Greeks, he might have been a, a philosopher king. Uh, to the Romans, uh, he might have looked uh, like a, a noble statesman. But the God of the Hebrews, how does he come into the world? As a carpenter. He came as a man who worked. And you and I, we are stewards of his creation. He said, I give you dominion over the earth as my representative to work in all kinds of ways so that we can fix and build and construct and serve and provide and organize and improve because the reality is that a child of God called to be the salt and the light of the earth, it ought to be left better having been here as a child of God. Everything that we do, what does salt do? It makes things better. What does light do? It brings light into darkness. You, this is, the, this is your role as a Christian, as a child of God, at the most basic uh, uh, core of who you are. What are you supposed to do? You're supposed to make things better and brighter for everybody that you come in contact with. That includes what we do in our work. Stewards of his creation to develop to, to lead culture. The command of Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, it, it quite literally was a command for them to create and to be in charge of and to develop a society on earth that reflects God as creator, sustainer, provider. That in everything we do, we are reflecting his nature through our laid down lives. And so we work in a world and, and, and because of, of his goodness and his blessing, people thrive and flourish. We create things. We provide goods and provide services. And though work is supposed to, uh, in, in the, the original um, command of work, and it was developed uh, for it to be purposeful. We lose sight of that, and sometimes work feels pointless. Uh, this is where I love Ecclesiastes. If you want to turn there, you can. But um, Ecclesiastes uh, starts off chapter 1, chapter 2, um, and really all the way through, kind of just like a depressing book. Uh, he starts off in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2 and 3. He says, Vanity of all vanities. Everything that we do. He says, what does man gain by his toil? Everything that he does, all the toil under the sun. What's the point? What's the purpose of it? He goes on to say in, in chapter 2, he says, I hated, this is chapter 2, verse 18 and 20. He says, I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must just leave it to man who will come after me. And he who knows whether he will be a wise or a fool, yet he will be master of all that which I have toiled and used my wisdom for under the sun. He goes on later in chapter 2, verse 23, he says, What has a man from all of the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all of his days are full of sorrow and his work is nothing but a vexation. 
Ecclesiastes, depressing book. <laughs> but in a very uh, real sense, it's true. <laughs> we feel this way at times. We work and we bust our butts and we work and we work and we sweat and we're tired and we're hurt and we're filled with pain and we get hurt at work and our boss is seemingly just getting richer and richer and things for me are just getting harder and harder and we get to that point in our life where, like, what's the point? Like, this is pointless. I don't understand, God. There's got to be more than this. Just let me go to some other country and be a missionary. Please, God, save me from all of this. But it feels pointless, something that he intended on being purposeful. Um, and although it was designed work to be selfless, oftentimes it can be selfish. Uh, exhibit A, the Tower of Babel. I mean, they were literally creating something in order to create identity. And, and you've seen this in the, the workplace. People uh, using each other as stepping stones to get to the next position, fighting for a name, fighting for a raise, just, I'm going to get mine, I want to be uh, more, I, I deserve more. Uh, and if we're not careful, we can end up looking at our jobs as places of identity, um, place where we get meaning, places where we find joy. Um, when we idolize or overvalue work, we fail to see God's limits for us. Um, I, I try to be very careful when I'm having conversation with someone new. It doesn't happen often because I'm introverted, but when it does, when I'm forced to do it, um, I try real hard uh, not to say uh, in that first sentence after meeting somebody, uh, what do you do for a living? Hi, my name's John. I'm this. What do you do? We have a tendency of doing this, yeah? Why? Because we, we've been taught that our identity is, is in what we do. Um, and so I, I try really hard to, to, to change that conversation and who am I, first and foremost, a child of God? Who am I after? I'm a husband. I'm a father. I'm a son. Oh, by the way, I do this, but that's not where my identity is found. Um, if our joy and our identity comes in our work and, and we, we fail to understand the limits that God has for us, uh, we can't put our work aside. We can't put our phone down. We're always checking emails. We're always making phone calls. Um, and, and, and something that was intended to come from God now comes from our work. There's another side of that, though, that says, you know, uh, I was taught that I'm supposed to do everything I can as though I'm doing it for God, and I'm going to give it everything that I have. Flip side of that equation is, is I don't want to do that. I don't want to give everything to work. I want to be a good this and this and this, and I don't have time for it. I want to be part of God's plan, and so then we just end up not working. And, and there's a, another term for that. That's just called lazy. <laughs> and so we have to constantly fight between the two. I don't want to be lazy. However, my identity is not what in, I, in what I do. It's not found in, in where I work. And so we're constantly trying to figure out how can I uh, not allow that distortion or this distortion of God's plan for my life. We don't want to say it has no meaning. We don't want it to be all the meaning. How do we find ourselves in the middle somewhere? And, and the reality of that is, is that no matter where we are, and we don't, this is not a good time to raise hands, it doesn't matter if you're lazy or if your work is your idol or if you're somewhere in between, we must rely on the sufficiency of Christ right where we're at. And say, Jesus, you are enough, and, and, and I don't want to undervalue my work, but I don't want to overvalue it either. I need you to transform the way that I work, the way that I view work, 
It can't have no meaning, but it can't have all the meaning. I need you, God. How does your life, how does the life of Jesus, his death on the cross for our sins, his resurrection from the grave, his victory over sin, his ascension to sit at the right hand of Father while we wait as a church for his return, how does that transform what I do in my work right now? Because here's the reality. Jesus has said, come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You see, this truth is huge. Martin Luther, he says this. And Martin Luther, just so you understand, he was not at all um, passionate about the work of the priests um, and, 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 and them being like some... Uh, upper class Christians as though like there's regular Christians and then there's these others that are like super Christians. Let me say this really carefully. We have a tendency of still doing that in the church today. Um, in the early 1900s, it was uh, the, um, uh, the, the move of the Spirit in the church uh, uh, that, that we said, okay, yes, you said yes to him, but if, if you're a good boy or girl, eventually uh, this Holy Spirit's going to come and dwell inside of you. Then you're going to be a super Christian, and, and we've always had a tendency of creating these people and these people. And Martin Luther says, no, 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 no. Trust the sufficiency of Jesus. He's everything that you need. Say yes to him. You're not waiting for some other move. We are always uh, uh, in a process of sanctification. And thank God, be patient with me because he's not finished with me yet. I'm a little bit better than I was last week, but just a little. So this process we're ever in, but when you say yes to him, you are justified before him. It is just as if you never sinned. You get everything that you need in that moment. And Martin Luther, he said this. He said, all work is equally pleasing and honoring to God. He said, if our works, specifically our religious works, earned us favor before God then of course clergy and popes and priests, they would be the most noble and they would have the most favor before God and everybody in that sense would be second class. But he realized this truth, that if we are accepted before God based solely on our faith and the finished work of Christ, then there is no work that we can do to increase our status. Before God, his cross has secured our salvation and we are free to rest in him as the only one that has done superior work. Jesus is the only one that's work was better or more important than anybody else's. He said it's pure invention that popes, bishops, priests, and monks are called to the spiritual state, while princes, lords, artisans, and farmers are called to the temporal. He says this is uh, deceit and hypocrisy. He said no one needs to be intimidated by it. It is for this reason that all Christians are of the spiritual estate, and there is no difference among them except that of vocation. That's the only difference. We, First Peter says it this way. He says, we're all consecrated priests. He says, you all are a royal priesthood. Luther says this. He says, it doesn't matter if you're a cobbler, a blacksmith, a farmer. Each has the work and office of his trade, and yet they are all consecrated priests. And everyone by means of his own work or office must benefit and serve every other. Yes! You, you know that, the, that scripture that says uh, that truth will set you free? Truth is not always palatable or easy. It's not always fun. 
but it's always freeing. That no matter what I do, I do it for his glory, and it's just as important as anybody else's work because I'm pointing people to him. Let me give you a really good example. I had to have some air conditioning work done in my house. Praise Jesus, I know a guy. <clears throat> and so I called Nick. I'm like, Nick, look, I need to move my um, condenser. It's on my back porch. It's loud. It's obnoxious. I want to move it over to the side of my house. Could you give me a quote? He gave me a quote. I said, that's perfect. Let's go ahead and do it. Only one thing. I need Eric to do it. And he's like, no problem. I can make that happen. Why? Because I know Eric loves me and he's going to do great work. Partially. <laughs> but more importantly, I know that Jesus dwells inside of him. And I know the honor and integrity because of the Jesus that dwells inside of him. That he was going to do work on my property where my wife and my children and my mother live. And so last Monday he comes and he does the work and I, I, I was even more impressed. I, everything is straight. The screws are equally uh, spaced. It's beautiful. Why? Because of the God that dwells inside of him being honored by everything that we put our hands to. That when someone looks at the work that we've done, they should be amazed no matter what it is. The work that was done by their hands. So you put your faith in Christ. You turn from your sin. You turn from yourself. You trust in him as Savior. You follow him as Lord. And then he transforms the way that not only that we work, but the way that we look at our work. Colossians chapter 3, verses 22 and 24 says this, Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ Jesus. You see what the Bible is saying here to us as followers of Christ? It's the first thing that it said back when we started in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In everything you do, including your work, you are worshiping God. You see, we call coming and singing some songs worship, and it is in a very powerful sense that when we gather together, it is good for you. God does things. It reveals his love and goodness to a lost and dying world. So important. But when we relegate just that to that which we uh, apply worth to, then, then we're missing a large portion of what God has called us to do. In everything that we do, we are worshiping the glory of God. It's not just singing, but worship is working. And when we allow that to be the lens in which we look at our work through, everything changes. Who are you ultimately working for? Colossians 3.23, the Lord. Colossians 3.24, what are we doing when we're there? We're serving, not man, but the Lord. It completely transforms the way that we look at it. And I'll be honest with you, it makes it a lot more pleasurable to be there. And, and you're probably better to be around, too. If we're honest, everything that we do, no matter what your job is, no matter what your work is, you are ultimately not working for this boss or that employer. You are ultimately working for God, and that changes everything. If we need meaning in our work, if we need motivation in our work, if we need to know the importance of our work, we realize that 
everything that we're doing, whatever those hours that we're called to be there, it's not secular work. And then show up here on Sunday and do spiritual work. That's not the way that God designed it. And when you see this and you realize this, every memo that you write on your desk is for the glory of God. When you're talking on the phone with a customer, it's for the glory of God. When you're preparing a lesson for your class, it's for the glory of God. When you're managing a company, placing an order, hammering a nail, fixing a leak, whatever we do, we're worshiping Him through our works. And so, how do we take it home? Four things. <clears throat> Number one, we work honorably. We work honorably. With integrity, by the way. Worship God through holy work. Um, do work that is ethical. Don't cut corners. Don't take your boss's extra material that he'll never notice. You, the the uh, office closet is not your supplier for pens at home. Work ethical. Don't compromise. Don't skimp on time cards. If you're getting paid for eight, work eight. Work it. Because it's for his glory. It's worship before Him. I love competition, but I don't compete at work in the way that the world competes at work. I don't have to make a name for myself because the name that is above every other name has already made a name for me. And I ask for things, but before I ask any man for something, I go to the supplier of all things. Jaira knows what I need long before I ask. We are all tempted at times to work in our work the same way that the world works in our work. But don't do it. Don't do it. Um, Ephesians 6 talks about that um, we work according to the will of God, not to the will of man. Number two, work humbly with respect. Ultimately, you are, we are bond servants of Christ. We honor the authority that he has in our life. Therefore, we honor those that are above us and below us in our profession. Pray for your boss. Serve your boss. Encourage your boss. Not with, like, begrudging resignation, but from a place of sincere, sincerity with a sincere heart, as Ephesians 6 says. Not doing anything sinful that he or she may ask you to do, but humbly honor the man or woman that God has put over you in your work. Because ultimately, we're bondservants of Jesus. And if you're a boss, a manager, or an employer, you're commanded to remember that you have a higher authority. And the way that he was an example to us as Savior King was that he got down on the ground and washed the feet of his disciples just before he laid down his life for them. Amen. That's the example that we have when we're put in a place of authority. Isabella and I had the opportunity, um, my oldest daughter, she's 11, to um, listen to Jonathan Isaac, a uh, basketball player for the Orlando Magic. He played at Florida State, 24-year-old man, uh, talk about how he um, walks with faith, um, with 
millions of dollars, tons of popularity, uh, basically anything at his disposal. How does he maintain the two? And uh, he said so eloquently, um, first of all, 24 years old, he's been dating uh, his girlfriend for a year, and he hasn't even kissed her, um, which I was so, I was like, praise Jesus, let my 11-year-old daughter hear that. <laughs> um, and, and he talked about how much better his relationship was just getting to know each other and how he's like longing for the moment, but uh, how uh, much it's done in his relationship. But he said this, he said um, he, he actually gave his life to the Lord um, his rookie season. So after the millions of dollars have come, after the popularity had come, he said uh, there, there was still something missing. He said, I worked my entire life to get to this, got there, and there was still a void. And, and he, he filled that void uh, with the, the cross of, of Christ. And um, he said that basically the way that he uh, maintains uh, his faith and he walks like the person that God has called him to be, he says he, he equates it as to being on a team and on an organization. He said, if I got traded from the Orlando Magic today, um, whatever team I went to, I would have to follow their rules and abide by their standards and do what it is that they led me to do. He said, in the moment that I chose to say yes to Jesus, I was given a whole different set of commandments. And because I love him, I follow those commandments. And by the way, they're not burdensome. They're not burdensome. He said, but because I am in this family, I follow a whole different set of rules than everybody else. And so when we have a boss or when we are a boss at whatever we do, yes, you have an employee handbook, but you have a life handbook as well that you are to follow and that we are to uh, understand what it does for us and the, the humility in which we are to walk no matter what position we find ourselves in. Give young people this advice all the time. They say, I hate my job. I don't want to work here. I say, easy. Get them all saved. And God will move you somewhere else. <laughs> Look, there's nobody else there to lead to the Lord. He's going to move you somewhere. So just do that. They're like, oh, no, you know, maybe it's not so bad. It's not so hard, right? <clears throat> but if you ever wanted to, if you ever want to lead, you have to be able to be led. If you ever want to be entrusted with great, you have to learn how to be entrusted with little. And uh, we, we have to be able to do that humbly. Third thing, two more things. I'm landing the plane, I promise. Uh, number three, work eagerly with joy. Work eagerly with joy. When I'm walking into my office, we have to park like a half mile away, and uh, I get to get my steps up first thing in the morning, so I just praise Jesus. Everybody else is mad that they're having to walk. I'm watching my steps go up and praising God for the place that I work, uh, how much I enjoy doing what I do, what he allows me to do there, the impact that I get to make in the community, and the fact that it, it does allow me to provide for my family. And so I start off the day with there's just being joy that God is allowing me to work another day. And it gets frustrating. But he says in Colossians 3 that I am to work heartily in everything that I do. Um, Philippians chapter 2, uh, verses 14 and 15. If you're having a hard time being a, a light in the workplace, my simple suggestion would be read Philippians 2, verses 14 and 15 every morning uh, when you pull into that place that, that you work. And it says to do all things without grumbling <laughs> or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation among whom shine as lights in the world. The workplace can be the most fertile ground for grumbling and complaining. Don't buy into it. Don't drink the Kool-Aid. Don't buy into it. Everyone can find something to complain about at work some more than others. However, hear this. Complaining 
does not honor God, whom you are serving while you're there. So don't grumble, don't complain, don't participate in that. How do we fight the urge? We fight the urge to complain with faith in Christ that has called you to walk in joy, not called you to walk in this person or that person or that facet, but he's called you to walk with him in joy in the workplace. And in Philippians 2 says this, when you don't complain, the Bible says that you will shine like stars in the world. We all want to make a difference. We want to, to do all these things. And we think that it's been uh, uh, relegated to just a few that have the opportunity to, to go to, to Haiti on missions. And that's a great call. But that's, that's not my call. My call is Mount Dora, <laughs> Lake County, Central Florida. This is my call. And he says, he says, John, you don't want to, you, you want to be a light? You want to shine like a star? It's easy. Just don't complain. Don't complain at work. And you're doing that. It, 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 he says, you will stick out in the world of work when you don't participate in the complaining. When you work with eagerness and with joy by a man or woman that is no longer dependent on their joy being found in work. Because the moment I said yes to him, he became my source of joy. I don't, I don't have anything to complain about because he's given me everything that I need. Christian, you are free to worship God wholeheartedly as you work. Not by telling others to stop complaining, but by you not complaining. That's the beauty of this. I don't have to tell everybody how bad they are. I just get to be the best me. Let's hear me. Let's don't do that. Let's be a people that refuse to judge somebody that we've never walked in their shoes. The only person that doesn't have something to complain about is you, the one that has put their faith in Christ Jesus. Last thing. <clears throat> Remember that passage in Matthew chapter 5 uh, where Jesus tells his disciples that if they are forced to um, carry uh, the, um, the, the people in the military, their, their pack a mile uh, to carry it to, uh, the most simple way that you can make an impact in your workplace it's just by deciding that I'm going to go the extra mile. That, that when I put my hands to something, it's going to be the best thing that this office, this place has ever seen. Because I did it, not for them, but for the glory of God. And it's deserving of the best that I have to offer. And so the, the question that we have to ask is, how can my job my work, my skills, how can I use that to impact the world? The reality is it starts right at home. Lake County will never be the same if just the 40 or 50 that are gathered here this morning would say, my work is transformed because I've been transformed by Christ Jesus. We know, we know that that his glory is going to go throughout the world. We know that every people group is going to have opportunity to know the gospel, and then he's going to return. We know this. What if God's design was this globalization of the workplace to send us into the world to make an impact through the work that we do spreading his glory and his name through that which we put our hands to. You see, I think the church of the past made it far more difficult than it had to be. 
And in doing so, we lost sight of that very thing that was right before us. He's given us an ability. Let's use it to make his kingdom known throughout Lake County, throughout Florida, throughout the United States, and God willing, even throughout the world. Let's pray. Close your eyes with me if you would. First and foremost, if you've never said yes to Jesus, everything I've just said is is nothing. It starts there. The greatest thing that I can tell you is that there's a God in heaven that loves you, that desires to walk in a relationship with you, and he wants to, to join you right where you are. Don't wait for the moment that you think you've got it all figured out because I promise you that day is never going to come. Instead, know this. Everything is better that Christ is involved in. And it's as simple as saying, yes, Jesus, I need you. So you're here this morning. It doesn't matter. We've been following him for our entire lives. We've flirted with him, but we've never entered into a relationship with him. It's never a bad time to remind ourselves, yes, Jesus, I need you. I need you in everything that I do. We all have different jobs. We all come from different backgrounds. Some of you are going to work this afternoon. Some of you are going back to work tomorrow. Some are retired. Some are looking for jobs. God knows your place, and he is sufficient in the midst of it. But hear me. God has a mighty purpose for your life. Don't ever allow the enemy to whisper in your ear and lie to you and tell you what you do is insignificant. God, of all the times that he could have put you here, he put you here now to reveal his glory and his goodness. And I promise you, it starts at home. It starts at work. It starts in our communities. God has decided that he is going to turn the world upside down through your life right where you are. Father, let us see everybody in this room the significance of the work we do. The lives that could be impacted by just us not complaining, by us going the extra mile, by us worshiping you with our work. Lord, for those, that man or woman that is here this morning, that going to work has always been tough. They've never looked forward to it. It's it's tough. They have a boss that uh, is is just seemingly impossible to work for. Maybe they, they don't earn what they're worth. God, I pray that you would use them in that place, that you would um, allow them to be uh, lifted up and promoted through that organization or another. But God, use the place where we are right now to impact those that are around us and to propel us to the place that you have ultimately called us to be. God, I pray that when this short, breathed life is over, that Lake County, that Florida, and that this world would be better and brighter because these your people existed in it for a time. Lives changed by our laid down obedient lives, God. Empower us and show us how you're working through us for your good and your glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I love you so much. Thank you for allowing me to be here today.